So we can ask a general question uh, regarding symmetry and physics. We can ask what, what are the symmetries to the laws of physics? And, and actually, this was sort of a new way to think that started in the early 20th century. And really, it was Einstein who, who pioneered thinking about nature in terms of symmetries. And you can ask the question, how do the laws of physics depend on where you are in space, where you are in time, what's your orientation in space, what's your state of motion? And in fact, we have you know, good experimental data on these things. We, we, we can, how, how could we determine whether the laws of physics are the same in the Andromeda galaxy as they are here on Earth? How could we get information about that? Well, you can look at the Andromeda galaxy, and you can just look at it through a telescope in your backyard. It looks sort of like the Milky Way. It looks like other galaxies. You look at two galaxies and compare them about the same size. It look, that already tells you there's something similar about them. Yes, sir? Is that a satellite there? You could do that. How long do you think it would take to get to Andromeda galaxy? We could get the thing close to the speed of light. We'd still be, uh, how far is it? Million is it about two million? So, so it'd take you know, some very, very distant future civilization <laughs> could get the data back again. No, the galaxy is sending the information to you right now. So it's sending you lots of light. And you can look at the light. And what do you see? And you know, I'm just going to editorialize it. It's great to have computer simulated experiments. But you actually have to build them and, and do them to really appreciate what's involved. And, and one of the best possible experiments you can do just on a Saturday afternoon is build a shoebox spectrometer. All you need is a, is a plastic diffraction grating. And I think you can order those from Edmund Scientific or you can go to this American Science Center up here in Geneva and get them. And, uh, and what you do is you, you, you take a shoebox and you, you make a little hole in the back and you put aluminum foil over the hole. And with a razor blade, you make a, a very uh, a narrow slit. And that's what you're going to point at the sun. So what comes through is a, through the slit is, is sunlight in the shape of a slit. And then on the other side, the back of the side of the shoebox, you put it, another hole and you put the diffraction grate in there. Okay, so you've got the slit. And then here you've got the eyepiece, which is the diffraction grating. And you hold the thing up to the sun, being careful, the usual cautions, don't want to get direct sunlight into the eyeball. But if you now look a bit to the side, what you'll see is a beautiful prismatic rainbow splaying out of the sunlight, into the, breaking it up into its colors. So if the sun is light's coming in like that, and you look to the side, and the diffraction grating will, will, will display the pattern there. And if you look carefully, by golly, you can see there are a lot of black lines cutting through that nice rainbow. And those are images of the slit that correspond to a precise frequency of light that isn't getting to us from the sun because the corona, all that gas surrounding the, the fireball, is absorbing that light. So you immediately can, with, with you know, a, one buck, diffraction grating and a zero-cost shoebox observe something absolutely profound, the absorption spectrum of the sun. And then you can do this to a street light at night, sodium vapor light. And if you want to start getting imaginative, you could do it, you could do it to a fluorescent light. You could start looking at different things. And what you'll see always are the patterns of the atomic absorption lines, the electrons jumping from well-defined quantum orbitals to another, well-defined energies, eating up the light. Or, in the case of a, of a sodium vapor light, you're seeing, you'll see bright lines. Because there you're seeing the specific electron transitions in the sodium vapor emitting the light. So, I believe the shoebox spectrometer is the most interesting homebrew experiment you can do. And, and I was so appalled a few years ago when I went to the internet, this vast, incredible source of, of all knowledge, and I couldn't find a simple uh, project plan for a home uh, built spectrometer. I was just amazed. So you got to put one of those on the <laughs> web, and you got to do that experiment, and you got to really do it, because you can look at pictures of this and you can see it simulated. 
but you gotta actually make one and you get then a better one if you use a better razor blade and you can maybe eventually have an adjustable slit. And then refine the optics, put the thing on a tripod so it's better uh, mounted there. Try to take pictures of the spectrum. Pretty soon you're really building a scientific research program of inquiry. I remember some guys when I was in high school who, who went to a, won the state student uh, the state uh, science fair by building a spectrometer uh, that was allowed them to see the Doppler motion of the rotation of the sun, and it was built with plywood and put together and, and, and tuned carefully, constantly. They, they, they had to take pictures and project them to blow the image up to see small little displacements of the spectral lines to catch the motion of the gas. And they won a uh, first place in the, uh, well, uh, yeah, I guess the, the, the most honorable thing you can win in the State Student Council Park. So uh, it's a uh, Illinois State uh, 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 Science Fair at that time, way back in the 60s. So uh, that's something you should do. It's a really hands-on thing. Well, we can look at the spectral lines of light coming from Andromeda. And quantum mechanics tells us that those are, those are measurements of the electron charge, the mass of the electron, the atomic nuclear uh, charges. It's measuring the Planck's constant. It's measuring the speed of light. And we can check that those are the same as they are here on Earth. And we can do that for very distant objects, quasi-stellar objects, et cetera. And what we find is, subject to experimental errors, and even some tantalizing controversy about whether it's true or not at a very subtle level, that the world is the same in Andromeda, in that region of space, two million light years away, or whatever it is, as it is here. And it's true all the way across the universe. As I say, there actually are nowadays some very precise measurements of certain things like uh, hyperfine splitting of atomic levels in very distant gas clouds that seem to be, according to some people, showing a discrepancy with, with what we see here on Earth. But that's a controversy, and it will get resolved by further for their uh, measurement. And that's very exciting if we found that the laws were different somehow, uh, one Hubble diameter away from what it is here. That'd be really big news. Are the laws of physics changing in time? We see no evidence of it. Again, at a certain level of precision. Do they depend on our orientation in space? Well, here you sort of have to imagine, yeah, they do, because you know, I drop something and it falls that way. But that's because the Earth is there. But if I'm in empty space, is there some intrinsic bias to the laws of physics that tells us there's preferred up, a preferred sideways, a preferred backward and forward? We don't see any evidence of that. So these seem to be symmetries. How about our state of motion? This is what all the relativity hullabaloo is about. When you are move, sitting on Earth thinking you're at rest, you're actually moving. You're moving in the Earth's orbit, you know, around the sun. But of course, the sun is also moving. And of course, the galaxy it's moving in is also moving. You don't notice any of these motions. And in fact, if you were on a different solar system, different planet someplace else, you'd be moving differently. If you're in the, on that planet doing all of these experiments, building backyard spectrometers, measuring spectral lines of sodium vapor lamps, will you see a different spectrum on a different planet associated with a different star in a different galaxy that's moving at a much different relative velocity to us? Apparently, no. We have an enormous amount of experimental evidence to, to, to show that the laws of physics don't depend upon the state of motion. In fact, if I do my lab experiments, I can go out into the universe and move around. I, and as long as this thing is just coasting inertially through space, even if it's falling into a black hole, you won't notice it as long as, it is, as the experiment is moving inertially. That's one of Einstein's other insights, is that free falling is actually inertial motion, but in a warped space, a warped space-time geometry, which is what gravity produces.